Hi, family. It's great to be back again, continuing with our series on families for such a time as this. And we are now going to continue with our study on the third chapter of the book of Genesis. And we had ended um, with verse 6, in which we just read what, you know, what happened exactly when uh, Adam and Eve both ate from the from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And remember, it was not completely Eve's fault. It was Adam himself that ate. And that is how sin came into the world and death came into the world and actually to all people, as we read from the book of Romans. So now we continue in uh, from uh, verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them, I'm reading from the NIV. I, my, my wife enjoys the New Living Translation, but I'm going to read from the NIV. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Such an interesting contrast. We had read in chapter 2 at the last verse that they were naked and they weren't ashamed of their nakedness. Uh, so it was as if they did not see with physical eyes. They saw them uh, through innocent eyes. They looked at each other through God's eyes, truly. Mm -hmm. The way that God wanted them to see each other. And in fact, the way that God wants us to see each other. And again, in our, in our marriage, in our, in our relationship with the husbands and wives, God wants us to see beyond the physical. And He wants us to uh, see the spiritual, who the person really is made in God's image. Um, through the eyes of God. And all of a sudden, as we had explained in the previous uh, part of chapter 3, um, the, the enemy strategy was to open, let their eyes be opened for the physical realities and losing sight of the eternal uh, spiritual realities, you know, and seeing the physical. And what happened? All of a sudden, they were looking with each other with physical eyes. And they were seeing each other's nakedness and each other's faults and mistakes. And that's exactly what the enemy wanted. He wanted them to focus on each other's weaknesses and mistakes. Yeah, true. Yeah, and so when, when our eyes are open, we, we see many times, we see our own, own failures and own mistakes because of the good, the knowledge of good and evil. So I would look at myself and I, I don't feel comfortable and I don't feel good enough. And, and then he said, they felt shame at their nakedness and they covered themselves. Now, now many times we, we do that. We are ashamed. I'm ashamed of my cellulite and what, 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 and the way I'm, I'm looking. And, uh, and the enemy wants us to hide, to cover, to, to, to especially the parts that's the most important. So his plan is to bring division, to bring masks. We have to put on a mask, you know, um, that I'm okay, but inside I'm not okay. And and the way I see you, I see you physically, and the way you look now, and you you don't look like like when I married you 20 years ago and 38 years ago and whatever. Uh, and so we have all these things that he's playing in our mind and that causes us to start drifting apart, to not... I mean, if you remember when you saw each other for the first time and you were dating and you can't wait to be with each other and you can't keep your hands off each other and... And suddenly, when you are married and, and life goes on, then it all goes like, you know, and that's the enemy. That's the plans of the enemy. He wants us to drift apart. He wants us to cover ourselves. He wants us to, to be separated, to hide, to, you know, not yes. to be together. <laughs> yes, and, and, and remember how they were before that. They felt no shame. They were completely open before each other and there was no um, accusation or judgment or oh you look like and this seeing, or that and seeing with spiritual mm -hmm. eyes this is a very important thing i mean i we should actually ask god the whole time to see each other the way he sees us can you imagine if you can the whole time see your husband the way that god sees him 
the plans that God has for him, the, the, the promises that God has for him, the way then you can be part of that and speak into that and work towards that and not see the way that you are seeing in the physical realm. Paul speaks about that much later, and he says, in Christ we no longer um, yeah. see each other uh, according to the flesh. Yeah, and that's the problem. You see, they were in the, in the flesh, True. just looking at the physical realities, and that is what happens many times in our, in our marriages as well. We begin to see each other's faults, the knowledge of good and Guilt. evil, and yeah. accusations, yeah. And, and so we do not... Um, feel comfortable anymore, open with each other anymore, transparency is, is gone and we are covered. There's no, no longer any sexual intimacy as she was just explaining. And, and that is what the enemy wants to do, not only separating us from God, but, but separating us from one another. Maybe, maybe it's a good thing to pause the video here and have a discussion, you and your husband, your spouse. Talk about this and, and see how has the enemy capture your minds and your thoughts in this process of we are hiding from each other. Are you open? Can you speak to him everything? Can he speak to you everything? Are you are you happy in your in your marriage, in your unity, in your getting together, or are you hiding and sowing fig leaves in important places, you know? So maybe it's a good time to speak to each other. Yes. Just do that. And so then in verse 8, it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? It's interesting, um, these, the contrast in these two verses, you know, um, they were hiding from God. Remember, that's what we talked about. The enemy strategy was to separate them from God. And indeed, that's what the prophet later on says, that it is our sin that separates us from God. That doesn't mean that God uh, no longer wants to speak to us. In fact, we see here God seeking the intimacy once again, seeking to come near to us. And, but it's in our hands whether we are willing to come near to God. Um, he always gives us this promise. Uh, if you come near to me, I will come near to you. Call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. But it is when we begin to hide that God cannot go beyond that. He, he wants to reach us. He wants to come to us. And it's interesting. It says uh, the, the, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord. So it says both of them heard the Lord. But it says the Lord God called to the man. Where are you? It says he called to them, where are you? That's very interesting. Why? Because again, I want to say to you men, God looks at you as the, as the gatekeeper, as the steward, as the responsible manager of your household. And so God comes to the man, where are you? Um, because it, he was seeking the, the, the man to be the one coming forward, being the one taking responsibility for the situation. Um, uh, and, and they could have run to God. And, and indeed, that is what God wants. Whenever we sin it, the yeah. Bible says, if we repent, He is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us from all uh, righteousness. Uh, Hebrews says, come boldly to the throne room of grace, you know, and, and we will find mercy. So, so it is really up to us, even if we have sinned, even if we have made huge mistakes in our marriage, um, it is it is not too late to to run to God and to and to be reconciled with God once again and to be reconciled with one another. And then he says in verse 10, the man answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid uh, because I was naked. So I hid. Mm, and, and isn't it sad that all of a sudden he was afraid? Yeah, and they heard, they heard God. He was there. They actually knew that God was there, but they hid in any way. And how many times are we doing exactly the same when we have fights and we have eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, judging each other, instead of coming together and read God's word and go to God and, and seek unity with him and with each other, we, we, we know he's there, but 
we don't want we don't want to be close to him no and this is all because of the fear he said i was afraid because i i was naked and this fear is a very interesting thing because god didn't give us a spirit of fear he says be very careful fear is a spirit and and we have to treat fear as a demonic spirit reject it and rebuke it in the name of jesus because he says i haven't given you a spirit of fear but of love power and a sound mind there we get again to that the the mind games you know and the power we we know that it's the same power that draws christ from the gate that's in us that's the power that we have to use against that fear knowing that in john 1 john 4 18 it says perfect love casts out all fear and god is love you see the enemy wants to twist everything he's sly and he's cunning and he tells you that when you are doing all the wrong things i don't care pornography whatever it is that we are doing judging and calling each other names and whatever it is instead of knowing that god has given us love power and a sound mind and in that submitting to god coming to him in our brokenness and in our sin hearing him calling us instead of doing that the enemy wants us to hide and the enemy is casting fear that god will not accept us god will not accept me my wife will not accept me i cannot so i i i'm rather defending myself than to trying to say you know here i am i made a mistake and God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And so God was telling them, uh, who told you? I didn't want you to see with physical eyes, like we talked about it before. I didn't want you to, to have this knowledge that would destroy you yeah. and destroy your relationships. I wanted you to remain innocent. I wanted you to remain pure in the way that you see each other and that you see yourself. Um, and 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 so so God knew exactly the con this was the consequences that he had told them. This is what would have happened. I told you that you would die, you know, that physical that spiritual death, and now you will just be reduced almost to a, a physical being. Um, you know, just focusing on the on the things that you can see and the things that are in front of you. And says, uh, and says, he would, who told you? And then he, the man, instead of repenting and saying, yes, Lord, I did eat from the tree. I am sorry. Uh, he becomes prideful and defends himself. And the man said, verse 12, the woman you put here with me, she g gave me some of the, f some fruit of the tree and I ate it. And so this is what happens all the time in our relationships with each other in marriage. Uh, and even with our children, it is so easy to do the blame game. So easy to begin accusing one another for our mistakes and our own sin. Mm -hmm. Not taking responsibility. And I think the Lord engaged the man first in conversation. Because I think he wanted Adam to take responsibility not just for himself, but also for his wife. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what God wants. That's what Jesus does. Jesus as the last Adam doesn't didn't only sanctify himself, but he says in, in John 17, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified, talking about his disciples. God, Jesus did these things in obedience so that he could sanctify everyone, so that we could be sanctified and cleansed and we could be forgiven. And so in the end, this is what God expects of us as men, not just to take responsibility for ourselves, but take responsibility for our families. The, everything we do, husbands, spiritually, investments we make, whether it be prayer, worship, fasting, seeking God, reading scripture, all those things have a direct spiritual effect over our families. And so the more we are in God's presence and we can do not as Adam has done, you know, but do as Jesus did, the more we can bring uh, forgiveness and, and, and sanctify our families as well. Yeah, and then, and then the Lord asked the women, what have you done?
Now that words, when I read it the first time and pondering on this, that hit me so hard because God made me your helper. He made me somebody to make you better. He made me a, a part of this family to bring the good out of out of you, out of the children and him. And so when I read this and, and I heard God speaking to me and he said, what have you done? The moment you eat that fruit, you don't understand. You are bringing everything down with you. You are you are so with the enemy, and it's a whirlwind of of depth and death, and it's drawing everything in the hole. You you know this this knowledge of good and evil, and your children becomes depressed, and your husband becomes depressed, and you are depressed, and everything is going downhill from there, and then we don't understand what is happening in our lives, but God is saying, wife, woman, what have you done? And then she didn't repent. <laughs> she didn't acknowledge also pride, saying, I know, I know I'm wrong. I shouldn't speak like that. I shouldn't judge like this. I shouldn't throw them with the fruit all the time and giving them this all right and wrong and right and wrong and judge the whole day. But I should give my family fruit of life. And then she said, it's not me. It's the devil. You know, he deceived me. That is why I ate. And it's the truth. The devil deceived us. But we cannot respond and we cannot take and we cannot give and we cannot feed. We as women has that role to say, God, help me to protect my family. Help me to not fall in the plans and schemes of the enemy. Help me to be the wife that God has created me to be. And so the devil is real, as Adele just said. You know, there is a real enemy wanting to destroy our families. But it is up to us. Adam and Eve, husband and wife, to not fall for the schemes of the enemy, to be aware of his uh, schemes. That's why Paul says we are not ignorant. Uh, you should never be ignorant of the fact that there is an enemy out there wanting to destroy your marriage and wanting to destroy your family. And the sooner we can realize that and walk in discernment, protecting each other, covering each other, praying for each other, building on our intimacy, um, and our unity before God and in our relationship with Him, the greater chance we have not only to resist Him, but to overcome Him every time He comes to seek, uh, to devour, as the Bible says. And so now the Lord, in verse 14, He addresses the enemy. He says, because you've done this, and He begins to uh, curse him and will not go into that. Uh, but interesting there in verse 15, he yeah. says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring, which also can mean seed and hers, and he will crush your head. This is mean the seed, the offspring of, of, of Eve will crush his head and you, meaning the enemy, will strike his heel, meaning also the seed, the mm -hmm. offspring. Yeah, and when we had a whole discussion about this, how how is it practically, how does it work? We all know in Ephesians 6, we have the shoes of peace on. That That is what it is. It's the shoes of peace to preach the good news. What is good news? Good news is forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Jesus came to forgive the sins of the world. That's the shoes of peace. Now, the enemy cannot get to our heel when we have our shoes of peace on. Okay, so he can only strike the heel when we are in anger. Okay, I am angry at you. I'm angry at God. I'm angry at my children. There's a whole bunch of anger running around in my house. And Ephesians 4, 26 says, if, if I don't forgive before the sun goes down, I am giving a mighty foothold to the enemy, meaning my door is wide open and the enemy can do whatever he wants. So he wants us to be angry. He wants us to live in anger. He wants the whole house open so that he can destroy and kill and steal as much as we want. So mom and dad is fighting. They are, they're not 
asking forgiveness. They are coming to God. They don't ask God forgiveness. They leave the house open. The enemy comes in. He destroys the kids. They are fighting. There's a whole bunch of darkness running around in our houses. And we don't even know it because the enemy has attacked our heels and we don't have our shoes of peace. And that is what we were saying with shoes of peace. Once we put the shoes of peace on, and the only way to put the shoes off is to forgive. I forgive you. I ask forgiveness with God. We reconcile mm -hmm. with the children. They cannot go to bed without them asking forgiveness of each other, of us, so that the house can be sealed in peace and not in anger. No? And, and it's so interesting that there's so many uh, so many uh, amazing scriptures in the New Testament that refers to this. You remember in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sent out the 70 and he said, uh, I will give you, I have given you uh, authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. Yeah. It, it's a direct reference to that, that he was giving them authority to crush this, yeah. to crush the snake, to crush the snake's head. Yeah. But the command in that chapter was to go with peace. See, so whenever you enter a house, say peace to this house. And then it's very interesting. Paul reflects on this in Romans 16, verse 19 and 20. And he says, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. Under your feet. He yeah. will do it. Yes, exactly. So the moment that we walk in that peace, in that forgiveness, in that uh, forgiving each other, reconciling with each other, and reconciling, walking reconciliation with God and with each other, that peace that surpasses all understanding. Uh, if we walk in that peace and that forgiveness and that grace, we will always be able to crush Satan's head. And in fact, sometimes Jesus will even crush Satan under our feet. We will not even have to do it. He will automatically submit to us because we are walking in with God's peace. Yeah, with, the, with the Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is all about forgiveness. Yes. So the moment we accept what Christ did for me, He forgave me, I forgive you, we are in forgiveness, He is doing crushing the enemy's head. And remember, that is, that is why it is so important that our homes would instead be, instead of being filled with anger and resentment and accusations, that our homes would be filled with God's grace and God's forgiveness so that there can be complete reconciliation. And so then in verse 16, uh, the, the, uh, God then speaks to the woman again. He says, I will make your, your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Yeah, in, my, in my Bible, it says, and you will desire to control your husband. And he will rule over you. Now, ladies, this is very important because that's, again, going back to the tree when he says, you can become, eat this fruit, because you can become like God. Be the goddess so that you can control your household, control your husband. You call the shots and everything happens the way you want to do. You decide what happens and everybody needs to, to just get in order so that there can be peace in your house because the moment when they go against you, there's... There's disorder, you know. So be very careful not to want to control, not to want to be this God in your house, no? So the, and then he, he, he speaks to Adam in verse 17. He says, because you listened to your wife, again, remember, it, the, it was, the sin was he could have stopped. He could have, he could have prevented these things from happening. But instead of being the leader, instead of being... Uh, the one that rejected the proposal of the enemy and protecting the wife, he, f he fell into the sin or the, the, the things that she had brought him. And he says, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. And then the Lord curses the ground. And he says, to painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, from dust you are, and to dust you will return. And then Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And, and this is important to, to realize that instead of uh, them making coverings for themselves, 
again, God took the initiative. Um, and obviously, this is a, a beautiful picture. An animal had to be slaughtered. Blood had to be spilled. For the, and a sacrifice had to be made so that God could take the animal's skin. And from that skin, not those leaves skins, anymore. not leaves anymore, but from skin, uh, coming from the sacrifice of something, he were, he, he, they were covered. In the same way, Jesus had to be sacrificed yeah. for us to be forgiven and, and for us sins to be forgiven. With him. And we are clothed with him. So such a, such a beautiful mm -hmm. picture. And then we, of course, know the picture, uh, the, what happened afterwards in verse 22. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. And I'd like to end just by saying um, that sometimes we think that we need to get back to the Garden of Eden. I know there are some people like sometimes they, they say, oh, it would have been nice for us to have stayed in the Garden of Eden. The wonderful reality is that we are not supposed to become like the first Adam. The reality is we are to be like the last Adam. We are to be like Jesus. And that means that our life can even be better than Eden because we can live in full fellowship with God and we can actually experience eternal life right now. What God has prepared for us as his children is much greater than what Adam and Eve had experienced. Mm -hmm. The life we have in Christ is much better than the life they had. Remember, they were not filled with the Spirit. Remember, they, they didn't have the fullness that we, as children of God, can now enjoy. But the key is exactly the same thing. It is really about reconciliation. It is about repentance. It is about not only asking God's forgiveness, but extending forgiveness one to another in our families. So that, again, we can experience that Eden, but it's even better than Eden, in our families. We can have God's presence in our families and in the same way that God had walked with them in the garden, in the same way God can be present in our families, in our marriage, uh, having fellowship with both of us so that our homes would be a safe place where we can grow in fellowship with God and we can become everything that God has destined us to be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus that came to rescue us from sin and death. Thank you for the cross that ha cleanses us from all sins. Thank you that you are faithful to forgive us our sins and cover our nakedness and take away our sin. And Father, I pray that you would help us in our marriages, in our families, that we would not run from you, that we would not hide from you, that when sin has taken place, that we would take responsibility, that we would repent, that we would confess our sins and repent. And Lord, that your forgiveness and your grace and your peace would flow in our families amongst husbands and wives and among children and parents. And Lord, that our families would be uh, full of your presence and that you would be uh, having fellowship with us in our family life. 24-7. Um, Thank you, Lord, for uh, wanting to restore. We want to pray for every family that has been ravaged by sin and by accusations and by uh, lack of intimacy. We pray for restoration. We pray for your presence to be there to cleanse and to take away all unrighteousness and to bring about your peace, your reconciliation, your harmony, your unity in this family unit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. It was wonderful to share with you. And we will continue uh, next time with our series on families for such a time as this. God bless you.